from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the reading and book and book history promotion part of the Library of Congress. And we're pleased to have people here from the American Studies Association and from the staff of the Library of Congress and a couple of members of the public who've come to uh, hear our Books and Beyond talk. Uh, the Center for the Book promotes books and reading around the country through affiliated state centers for the book. Uh, we also work uh, hard on the National the Library of Congress National Book Festival, which is held uh, on the mall every year with over 100 writers. It's the Library of Congress's kind of major public event in the areas of promoting books and reading and promoting itself in many ways. Uh, this series that uh, you're joining us for today is called Books and Beyond. And these are noontime talks by people who've produced new books. And we love to show off new books as the product of research, not only at the Library of Congress, but in other uh, facilities and other institutions. Uh, the idea is that we also film these. These are all a film for the Library of Congress's webcast and website. And on the Library of Congress's website, read.gov, uh, you'll find more than 250 of these noontime talks that cover all subjects. We uh, love being able to work with other divisions in the library. And for example, today's program is co-sponsored with the Manuscript Division, which is appropriate, because as you will hear from our speaker, uh, he made special use of uh, a couple of uh, some very special items that are in the manuscript division. Uh, the notion would be that uh, we will hear from our speaker, then there will be a, a short question and answer period. Uh, because of the webcast, we ask that you turn off all things electronic, and we hope that you are able to participate in the Q&A session, but your participation also kind of gives us the okay to include you uh, in the website if that's the way that the website is produced. Uh, I also would like to begin, however, and I'm acknowledging uh, Julie Miller, who is here from the Manuscript Division, with a few notes about the Library of Congress's uh, possession and how we came into, uh, how we received this uh, wonderful manuscript that we're going to be hearing about from Dennis. Uh, Dennis's latest edition of Hector St. John de Couver's, uh, excuse me, de Couver's A Letter from an American Farmer is based on a set of original manuscripts in the Manuscript Division. These are the same manuscripts that were in his trunk in 1779 when disillusioned with the American Revolution, he left, in, left the, his farm in Orange County, New York, and to return to France. Uh, passing through occupied New York City, uh, the British uh, st st stopped Crevacure and opened his trunk. The officer who inspected the manuscript found inside something described as a sort of irregular Journal of America. The 12 essays that were published in London in 1782 as letters from an American farmer are well known. What is well known what is less well known is that the, the trunk contained not only the 12 essays that became Crevacour's book, but more unpublished essays, many of them reflecting his darkening view of America during the Revolution. Crevacour's manuscripts, published and unpublished, remained in the hands of his descendants until the 1920s. They were discovered by Henri Boudin, and most, but not all of them, were published in a series of journal articles and a book. In the 1970s, the Crevacure family decided to sell the manuscripts and put them in the hands of a French rare book manuscript dealer. The Library of Congress tried to buy them, but the price was too high. 
The dealer sold them along with the Crevacure papers, and then in 1986, the library got another chance when the dealer who had bought the manuscript put them back on the market. This time, with the help from funds from the Morris and Gwendolyn Kafritz Foundation, the Library of Congress bought them. Uh, Dennis Moore's two editions of the Crevacure's letters, the one published this year and an earlier one published in 1995, present all of Crevacure's essays as they appear in the manuscripts at the Library of Congress for the first time and according to modern standards of documentary editing. Julie adds, documentary editors like Dennis Moore working on projects like this one are in the manuscript division's reading room almost every day. These editors' invaluable and fundamentally democratic work transcribing, explaining, and publishing manuscripts makes these texts accessible to a wide audience who would not otherwise be able to read them. Collecting, preserving, and making available manuscripts such as Crevacure's letters is what the Manuscript Division does, and we are proud to have been part of the process that made this book possible. And now, to introduce our speaker, I am proud to introduce Paul Erickson, who is the Director of Academic Programs at the American Antiquarian Society. Let's give Paul a hand. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, John. It's a, it's a rare honor to be here today. It's an honor to be at the uh, center, of the book, uh, center for the Book here at the Library of Congress, which is a sibling institution to the American Antiquarian Society's program uh, for the history of the book in American culture. And it's also an honor to introduce Dennis Moore, who is a friend and colleague and uh, fellow laborer in the vineyard of early American studies. Uh, Dennis received his BA from Clemson University, his MA and PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he's currently uh, the university's distinguished teaching professor in the Department of English at Florida State University, where he's taught since 1991. Um, Dennis is the founder and organizer of the Early American Matters Caucus uh, of the American Studies Association, uh, which is meeting here in Washington this week. Uh, he is currently president of the Southern American Studies Association. He's a former president of the Society of Early Americanists, uh, and he has long been active as a liaison to the American Society uh, for 18th century studies. Um, so when I said that it was a rare honor to be here today, uh, it's, that is because Dennis, as those, that roster of appointments indicates, Dennis is the great organizer of early American studies. Uh, he is constantly assembling conference sessions and roundtables and symposia. Um, and as a result, he is always introducing other people and never gets introduced himself. In fact, I have never seen Dennis introduced. Um, so I'm attempting something that uh, I don't know that has ever happened. Um, uh, so as, as John said, uh, today Dennis is going to be talking about his wonderful new edition of Letters from an American Farmer by Hector St. Jean Crevecourt, uh, published this year by Harvard University Press. And please join me in welcoming Dennis Moore. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, John, and, and Julie Miller. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Ah, it, it's an honor to be here under the auspices of the Center for the Book, uh, and also to have the co-sponsorship, Julie Miller, of the Manuscript Division. Given that we've gathered. Uh, at noon today, November 22nd specifically, it's time, I think, to take a moment to acknowledge that in a couple of hours, uh, 50 years will have passed since that moment when Walter Cronkite uh, told his already stunned television audience, from Dallas, Texas, the flash apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Paul Erickson, as many of you know, is the director of academic programs for the American Antiquarian Society up in Worcester. Uh, as many of you might not be aware, he stands out as one of the leaders in the community of scholars who, uh, how do we say, toil in the vineyard, Paul, of 18th century American history and culture, both as a truly tireless member of the ad hoc working committee that helps to organize and operate the American Studies Association's Early American Matters Caucus, and as quite the presence in another interdisciplinary organization, which, Paul, you mentioned, uh, ASEX, or the American Society for 18th Century uh, Studies. It's a pleasure getting to work with you, Paul, and uh, it's a pleasure, too, to see the many ways that Paul helps encourage and nurture scholarship on early American matters. I should note, too, that one of Paul's many skills is finding just the right venue 
for the reception that the ASA's Early American Matters Caucus sponsors, and, and now it gets to co-sponsor practically every year at the National Conference. Uh, the one this Saturday, the one tomorrow, thanks to Paul's scheduling skills and his generosity with a bit of financial support, will be at an establishment a short walk from the Washington Hilton called the Boardroom. We're co-sponsoring with the ASA's uh, Environment and Culture Caucus and beginning this year with the Early uh, Caribbean Society. As for being back in Washington, uh, it's always exciting for me when the American Studies Association does return periodically. As many of you know, there will be an interdisciplinary colloquy tomorrow afternoon, in fact, on Annette Kolodny's fine award-winning uh, book, In Search of First Contact, The Vikings of Vinland, The Peoples of the Dawnland, and The Anglo-American Anxiety of Discovery. And next March uh, at Williamsburg, uh, the annual conference of this organization, ASEX, the um, Interdisciplinary American Society for 18th Century Studies, will include an interdisciplinary colloquy there. Uh, on this book, um, the John Harvard Library edition of letters from an American farmer and other essays. Uh, meanwhile, for me as a scholar of earlier American literature and culture, and as a reader who has really for a long time been interested in J. Hector St. John or St. John, J. Hector St. John de Crevecoeur, and in his fellow Frenchman who came to America half a century later, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. The expression being back in Washington certainly has special resonance. In the summer of 2005, I made a trip back to the manuscript reading room, Julie, downstairs, uh, specifically to check on some details in the materials that I had earlier spent several summers working on. The treasure that the library purchased in 1986, as John Cole mentioned, the treasure that is the holograph manuscript that one of those two French-born writers, Crevecourt, who arrived in what is now Canada in the 1750s and had a decade later moved to the colony of New York where he became naturalized as James Hector St. John, or again, St. John, um, who was literally an American farmer. Given that we as citizens of the United States own the materials here in our Library of Congress, the title of my comments here this afternoon could just as easily be Kravkur and Our Letters. Um, while living the peaceful, pastoral, idyllic life of an American farmer, St. John, whom I will now refer to for the rest of these comments as Crevecourt, just as I do in the John Harvard Library volume and in my other uh, scholarly publications. Uh, Crevecourt also wrote a series of essays on life here in the English colonies, observations that he fashioned, crafted, as letters from Farmer James, a fictional character who was simply a very simple American farmer. During the summers of 1991-1992, I worked closely, indeed intimately, with the Crevecourt manuscript. And in the process, I had to deal with several puzzles, most of which I gradually figured out, but one of which is still very much a live question for me. So heads up, I plan to share it with you this afternoon. Uh, there's some others, other questions I'll raise along the way as I lay out the history here of a book. That book, John, the John Harvard Library volume, Letters from an American Farmer and Other Essays. As I occasionally raise questions, I hope and trust that you will feel free to participate so that my voice will not be the only one in play in today's session, just as Crevecourt gets quite a number of different voices in play throughout this John Harvard Library edition. There are two timelines in the story of this new book. And as I lay out both of them, you'll see that the central date is 1782, the year in which this French-born writer had the great good fortune to have the premier printing house in London, the same business that had published uh, Dr. Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language um, back in the 50s, as well as a book by Crevecourt's fellow Frenchman Voltaire called Letters Concerning the English Nation. Like that 1733 book by Voltaire, Crevecourt's 1782 book, Letters from an American Farmer, consisted of materials and essays, really, that he had originally written in English. In the introduction to the new John Harvard Library edition, uh, I describe having figured out the puzzle of how this fellow from the wilds of North America could have possibly persuaded such a prestigious printing house to look at, let alone to publish, his collection of essays, these epistolary fictions. This ambitious young immigrant's timing was exquisite. 
in that he took these so-called letters to those London printers in the relatively narrow window of time or, or of opportunity between two milestones in the lives of Britain's North American colonists. In October 1781 at Yorktown, the tune that Lord Cornwallis's band played was The World Turned Upside Down. The colonists' revolution was over, at least militarily. When was it over diplomatically? 1002, 1003, 1783, that's right. In the autumn of 1783 with the Treaty of Paris. By then, the question that Crevecourt raises in the title of that book's third selection, What is an American?, had become extremely topical. Uh, if we can try to gauge a book's topicality by its sales, the 1782 book sold really, really well as did editions that popped up in Dublin and Belfast and on the continent. And so by 1783, barely a year after his London edition of Letters appeared, Crevecourt had published a new edition that included a number of tweaks. I worked with that 1783 edition, by the way, as well as with the manuscript that the Library of Congress now owns in preparing this new John Harvard Library edition. Now, as this slide suggests, the years 1784 and 1787 are also very much a part of that original timeline. By 1784, Crevecourt had given in to pleas from his fellow Frenchmen and French women to publish a French version. Yes, he had written the original essays, this, the manuscript that is down in the vault, Julie, in English. But no, he did not translate them for the two-volume French version that appeared in 1784, Lettres d'une cultivateur américain. It sold so well, this French version, it's also well that he agreed to rework more of the materials he had written in English into French, reworking them, so that anyone who had purchased the two-volume of 1784 would want to purchase the three-volume version in 1787, even though they realized it was obvious that the first two volumes of the 1787 set were the same as those two volumes from 1784. Might it have seemed as if this trajectory would continue Probably, except, well, in mid-July 1789, the storming of the Bastille changed everything for everyone in what we think of as the Atlantic world. No. Well, a few minutes ago, before bombarding you with all these dates, I mentioned that two timelines enter into the story of this new book. So here quickly is the second, beginning with this by now familiar date and a much more recent date, which is now. You'll recall that in 82, Kravker turned 12 of the essays in the manuscript downstairs, all of which he had composed in English, into the book Letters, and that he went on to rewrite, rather than translate, many of those selections, as well as many of the other pieces that are here, into French. Between those days, though, and the publication of the John Harvard Library edition, what happened to those originals? We know, because John Cole told us a minute ago, several generations of Crevecourt's descendants handed them down so that in the mid-1920s, well over a century after the author's death, three scholars, including Henri Bourdin, learned about this stash of papers in a Paris attic and worked together to cobble together a second volume of essays, Sketches of 18th Century America. And I say cobble together specifically because they managed to pick and choose from among the pieces that had never been published in English and to construct what did seem, and I emphasize seem, very much like a sequel to the 1782 book, a volume two to that original, which in hindsight began to feel as if all along it had been really volume one. Moreover, they published four other pieces in periodicals, with one, for example, appearing in The Nation and another in the Yale Review, a time period that we can picture in this timeline between 1925 and the present is the 1980s, when Penguin published this uh, mm, volume in its Penguin Classic series, and when the Library of Congress also purchased the treasure, so the 1980s. At that time, I had the privilege of working uh, with the late Everett Emerson who had been the founding editor of the journal Early American Literature and had brought that journal with him when he moved from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst to Chapel Hill, where I was uh, beginning as a PhD student, learning that the Library of Congress now owned these writings. 
I was happy to build a dissertation around them, focusing specifically on the five pieces that at that time were still not in print at all. Uh, that work involved several trips up here to D.C. from North Carolina, during which time this particular copy of the Penguin Classics paperback got tattered, or as we say, way tattered, as well as getting this little, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, there's a stamp here that says approved, um, showing that when I had to take my little paperback out of my locker and walk over to my table in the manuscript reading room with it, it was all right to do so. Those trips back and forth brought numerous opportunities to work with the late Mary Wolfskill and her very knowledgeable, very patient staff. So in late 1994, nearly seven decades after the publication of Sketches, the Modern Language Association's Committee on Scholarly Editions designated this book More Letters from the American Farmer, an edition of the essays in English, left unpublished by Crevacour. They designated it an approved edition. Its official publication date is, yes, 1995. And, and yes, I encourage you to check out that edition, wherein you will find that I very faithfully and very painstakingly replicated the many strikethroughs and interlinear additions, the many loops around a word or a line or a passage, often with a clear enough indication of where to in effect, cut and paste it uh, so, that it, so that that part of the text would fit better. In fact, take a look here at one such page. Yikes. Uh, I'll come back to this page in a few minutes. But first, here's the way the text ended up looking in, in that mid-90s edition. Ah. Um, this slide doesn't include all of the description on the inside of that dust jacket. So allow me real quickly to read the next sentence or two and then to move on to the new John Harvard Library edition. So just below the paragraph that ends with letters has helped subsequent generations to grasp the ethos of a nascent America, it goes on to say um, more than a century after Crevacher's death, three bound manuscript volumes surfaced that included not only the original handwritten texts of most of letters, but also the 22 similar writings that now make up more letters from the American farmer. Those manuscript volumes are now housed in the Library of Congress. Five of the pieces in more letters, five of the pieces here, were at the time previously unpublished. The others were first published in 1925, 1926, but were so inconsistently and so arbitrarily edited as to misrepresent the author. Well, as for the new 2013 book, the John Harvard Library edition, um, it contains just over two dozen selections, every one of which Krevker originally wrote in English, right? It places those 12 pieces from Letters from an American Farmer, which he published in London, 1782, in a broader context, the context of his other writings in English, by adding a baker's dozen of his other essays. And again, all from that manuscript that's in the vault downstairs. The, the press, the Harvard University Press, has cautioned me that under the terms of their copyright, I may not read from this new edition in a videotaped presentation. So I will read instead this afternoon from this tired little Penguin Classics paperback, which, yes, the new edition supersedes. Or better yet, from my photocopy of the original manuscript from which I've prepared a few more slides. If you were going to read those essays, those fictional letters, those epistolary fictions, you could certainly read the original itself, which is ordinarily locked safely away in the vault um, downstairs here in the Madison building. To do so uh, does, of course, require a considerable amount of paperwork. Uh, so you could instead read from the scholarly edition that appeared in the 90s, more letters. As for viewing some images from the manuscript, you will each have an opportunity to practice reading and often deciphering as we saw a moment ago, his original handwriting. Speaking of images, do you recognize this sublime image that was on the screen when most of you walked in, certainly before Dr. Erickson introduced me? Well, yes, it's Andrea del Sarto's magnificent Christ as the Man of Sorrow from the website of the Academia Gallery in Florence, where you also encounter Michelangelo's magnificent David. This painting takes its title from a verse in the Old Testament book of Isaiah prophesying that Christ would be, quote, 
despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That Bible verse, yes, also echoes in the title of the song that the Stanley Brothers recorded in Nashville 63 years ago this month, I Am a Man of Constant Sorrow. Uh, more recently, as in five Friday afternoons ago, as part of the inaugural Rhodes Scholars series that the School of the Humanities at Clemson University has staged this fall, coinciding with several home football game weekends, I got to lead a discussion building on the title, O Farmer of Feelings, Where Art Thou? Reading Crevaker's What is an American? You'll likely recognize that provocative, seemingly self-evident question, What is an American? as the title of the selection within letters from an American farmer, that 1782 book, that most people who've ever read anything at all by Crevaker are likely to have read. In fact, most people who've read that selection did so in an introductory course on American literature and or in an introductory course on American history. To move for a moment now beyond that selection, I'll mention that the final selection in the new John Harvard Library edition does not come across at all as a letter. Clearly, it functions simply as an essay, a sketch, a reflection on life in the British colonies in North America. Its title, the last selection in this new edition, like the title of that painting, echoes that Old Testament verse. Krevkar named it the Man of Sorrow, and we could come back to it time permitting if you'd like. Right now, though, I, I do want to come back to that most widely read selection of Krevkar's, one that he does set up so that it seems to be a letter. In that most widely read selection, one encounters a tantalizing yet thoroughly naive answer to the question in the, select, in the selection's title, What is an American? The voice through which Krevkar provides that answer is that of, let me read you a brief snippet from the dust jacket of the John Harvard Library edition, trusting that I can do so without violating the copyright laws of the land. The American farmer of the book's title is Krevkar's fictional persona, Farmer James, a bumpkin from rural Pennsylvania. There. Here's the way a portion of that essay looks in the manuscript. So again, this is from, this slide is from uh, the manuscript of letter three, What is an American? In a, in a minute, I'll show you a more close-up version of what's on view right here, right now, uh, so that together we can make out what it is that Krevker is having his narrator say about the question, what is an American? First, though, I have a question about a much more recent text. Where in the world did New York Times columnist Tom Friedman get the notion he refers to in a recent column like so? This is Tom Friedman. In a world that rewards imagination, we have an incredible melting pot of immigrants that constantly blends together new ideas from technology to commerce to the arts. He made that observation in late September, and when I looked it up to include in these comments, the search engine at the New York Times website listed more than a dozen hits linking Friedman's name and that seemingly simple expression melting pot. At the top of the list is one from August 2008, whose headline was Melting Pot Meets Great Wall. So my question is still floating in the air here. Where does Tom Friedman or any of us get that idea of a melting pot? I'll go. It, it does indeed come from our man Crevacor. And while the expression doesn't actually appear in letters, either in the original 1782 edition, nor in the new John Harvard Library edition, the expression melting pot doesn't appear there. It's an idea with which Krevkar certainly managed to capture the imagination of a world eager to figure out what America was or was going to be at the moment that these colonists had been putting themselves through America's first civil war, which ended with independence from Britain. Another way that Krevkar captures many readers' imaginations in the 18th century, certainly as well as in our own lifetimes, is by emphasizing details that involve feelings. His first-person narrator in most of, this, uh, most of his 1782 book, uh, Farmer James, frequently talks about feelings. For example, all my emotions are tied up in my children and my farm. For example, and I'm paraphrasing, my wife doesn't understand me, and so on. Um, and it becomes easy to assume that that, that I that self-proclaimed farmer slash narrator is simply that writer. One version of that assumption here in our own lifetimes is what I'll call reading a blog. It's just a letter after all, just something that this guy has jotted down between bouts of plowing and other chores, just an early equivalent of a blog. Such blurring of a writer and that writer's fictional narrator is part of a tradition, as in the tradition of an as is the tradition of encouraging us as readers to identify so much with the narrative voice that we blur this voice 
and whatever the writer's voice must sound like. If we could hear it, it's as if we do hear it, as we see in this comment from a century ago by the novelist D.H. Lawrence, who rhapsodized in studies in classic American literature that while, quote, Franklin is the real practical prototype of the American, Crevacore is the emotional. And Lawrence also emphasized that, quote, Crevacore's letters are written in a spirit of touching simplicity. Lawrence had published an earlier version of that essay in, in an issue of the English Review, but in that version's first paragraph, he completely blurred author and the fictional narrator of letters, referring to the book as, quote, a series of delightful, egoistic accounts of his own ideal existence as an American citizen. Such blurring of Crevacor and the rustic Farmer James continues to the present moment, despite the recent flowering of scholarship on Crevacor and his ambitious epistolary fiction letters. So let's go back to letter three, what is an American, and let's take a closer look now at the manuscript. Ah, this selection provides two answers, or rather two cliches, and while we can see that his handwriting is not going to be particularly easy to read, this little arrow helps us zero in on what this narrator, the fictional farmer James, is stating here quite flatly. Here individuals of all nations are melted into a new one. So no, not the expression melting pot, but definitely the idea, or rather the cliche. For many folks, seeing someone describing this brand new nation in this way can reinforce the notion of American exceptionalism, which is certainly a topic for another day. We often hear people referring to this idea, this trope, this meme of the melting pot as abiding. But do you agree that the idea of a melting pot is really accurate, let alone that it lasts through the ages? I don't. I, I see no real evidence that people from all over have really ever mooshed together. And in a 1999 collection of essays called Teaching the Literature of Early America, uh, I published an essay called From the Melting Pot to Multiculturalism, which would lead to another conversation. So here instead is a follow-up to my earlier question about the source of that cliché. How many of you have ever encountered the letters from America that this British journalist, and I was going to bring the book, but it's, it's a really bulky book. So this British journalist uh, generated for nearly six decades. Meet Alistair Cook, who is a fixture on the BBC as their correspondent from North America. And the BBC website describes his correspondence, those letters, as, quote, Alistair Cook's weekly talks on American life, history, and politics, over 900 programs as broadcast from 1946 to 2004. He also found time to host Masterpiece Theater, and uh, it did morph into Masterpiece, and rumor has it that there was once a Sesame Street piece in which a Muppet named Alistair Cookie was introducing a program called Me Claudius. Okay, I'm old enough to have heard a number of those radio commentaries by Alistair Cook, those letters from America, and more recently I've become fond of another set of informal postings that could, in fact, borrow Krevker's title, Letters from an American Farmer. Verlin Klinkenberg's occasional columns in the New York Times under the heading, The Rural Life. To think about such idyllic rural details brings us to the second cliche that's also at the very heart of this letter three. Yes, this narrator, Farmer James, is now proclaiming that men are like plants. And being the fictional farmer that Farmer James is, he asserts that, and I'm going to quote here, the goodness and flavor of their this would be men's, in a generic sense, comparable to Mr. Jefferson's all men are created equal. Um, he asserts that the goodness and flavor of their fruit proceeds from the peculiar soil and exposition in which they grow. It's quite a stirring cliche, particularly for readers living in the confining, cramped world of Europe, the so-called old world. For such readers, putting one's roots down in the fertile, wide-open terrain that this bumpkin farmer James is describing has to turn out well. Now, does the book Letters, 1782, does it turn out well? If you have not yet read Letters, that simple question might itself seem tantalizing. You've already seen that my comments today revolve around a number of questions, so let me step back a moment and show you a snippet from another selection, one that did not make it into Letters, did not make it into the 1925 book Sketches, did not make it into print at all until 1995 in that collection, More Letters. 
This passage is from a wonderful little essay entitled Rock of Lisbon, Lisbon as in Portugal. And in preparing these comments, I considered whether this wry, detached observation about questions might be my favorite passage from all these materials. I figured out, though, that while this one might be my second favorite, the one I like a little more is this one in the middle of the long selection Susquehanna, which I will, of course, read quickly from the Penguin Classics edition. No contrast in this country can be greater and afford a more pleasing idea than when, on the summit of the Minnesink Heights, you contemplate below fruitful farms, smiling fields, noble orchards, spacious houses and barns, the substantial habitations of wealthy people settle these 120 years on those happy bottoms. Of course, he's talking about river bottoms. Back to my question then about whether letters ends as well, as optimistically as letter three would have us believe. Rather than giving away the answer by giving away the ending of these 12 fictional letters or even mentioning the title of letter 12, Distresses of a Frontier Man, rather than mentioning the painfully dystopian sense of unease there at the end, I will instead say a little bit, a little bit more about another selection that was in 1782 letters and therefore is also in this John Harvard Library edition. And then I'll spend a bit more time with that really long selection, Susquehanna, in which the narrator, whoever the narrator is there, relishes the thought of those wealthy people sitting on those happy bottoms of theirs. So the ninth selection in letters in that 1782 book involves Charleston, as we gather from this title, which appears on the handwritten table of contents Krevker prepared in assembling the first of those three bound manuscript volumes that together constitute the treasure down in the vault. And this is the way that first handwritten title page looks. Uh, if you opened a copy of the 1782 book, or, or even in the Penguin Classics edition, you would encounter, instead of that title, a different, far more detailed title. And here I think it's number six. But in the printed version, it's, quote, description of Charlestown, thoughts on slavery, on physical evil, a melancholy scene. So if this Charlestown that is so central to this ninth letter is Charleston, South Carolina, and it is, then a, another question arises. Hmm. The question here is, given that the first dozen words in this selection are, and I'm going to quote the very opening of that letter nine, Charlestown is in the north, what Lima is in the south. One question is, Charleston's in the north, really? Well, really, the comparison there is between Charleston in the Carolinas and Lima, Peru, in that other huge landmass we also refer to by the name America. That deceptively simple, forthright juxtaposition, Charlestown is in the north, what Lima is in the south, is a reminder that this writer Kreviker had quite a broad perspective on the term American and on the question he made seem central to that book, What is an American? That question in that essay or letter three seems to be at the heart of his 1782 book letters, but were we to sit down and read more of that book letters, we would see that it's another of the selections, the one that begins by placing lovely Charleston in the north, that is even more central to the book and to the way that this naturalized American thought about the new nation of America and its place in the world. So before moving on here to the selection that Krevker named Susquehanna, I want to say a bit more about his perspective on the so-called new world. I still don't want to give away too much about the ending of his 1782 book letters, but I've already referred a few minutes ago to, quote, the painfully dystopian sense of unease there at the end. So I will at, I will at least reveal the progression, the narrative arc, if you will, that is built into the collection of 12 fictional letters. There's certainly a progression from an optimism in letter three, what is an American, that can sound, even upon first reading, giddy, if not a bit seppy. A progression to the same fictional narrator's distress and despair about the, about the fact that his neighbors are, and here's a spoiler alert, his neighbors are revolting. This progression is built into the book, but it, the linear progression among these pieces, is not there when you sit down with Krefker's manuscript. So yes, my lapsing for a moment there into passive voice, this progression is built into the book, reflects my not knowing 
whether Krevker himself cooked up the exact sequence or whether the printers, or we would say publishers, of course, who made such crucial decisions? We don't know with we being a set that includes scholars and readers any more than we know about another equally crucial decision which involved choosing which of this fellow's writings to include in that 1782 book. We do know that the selection he named Susquehanna did not appear in that 1782 book letters. It did appear in print in 1925 in the posthumous collection Sketches of 18th Century America. I say that Susquehanna appeared in the 1925 book Sketches, but it's really important to acknowledge that the version of it in Sketches is not the entire 48-page selection within the manuscript that Krevker entitled on his first page, Susquehanna. The first portion of that really long manuscript selection does appear in the book Sketches under the title that the 1920s editors cooked up on the Susquehanna. What happened to the remainder, though, of the 48-page selection? Those same editors published the remainder separately in the Yale Review, giving it the title, The Wyoming Massacre. When Albert Stone was assembling uh, this Penguin Classics edition in the beginning in the early 80s, he, uh, 1980s, he made a wonderful and wise decision to reunite those two portions of the manuscript. So you'll be pleased to know that when I was working with the manuscript a decade later, creating that book, More Letters, whose subtitle, you'll recall, is an edition of the essays in English left unpublished by Crevacor, I kept those two parts together, but based the text on the manuscript rather than on what had gotten into print in the 1920s. Okay, several pages into that selection, Susquehanna, the narrator stops to reflect on the potential value of his observations and reflections on the settlements that colonists are creating along the surging Susquehanna River. I'm going to read you this really brief passage uh, and, and not from the Harvard edition. How many inquiries will be made by posterity concerning the time, the era, the various circumstances which have attended the foundation of this or that noble settlement? Alas, it will be lost like all other records in that great stream of oblivion which perpetually effaces and carries off the documents of some societies in order to make room for the succeeding ones. Now, if we were reading from that 1925 book, Sketches of 18th Century America, or from the Penguin Classics paperback that includes the contents of the 1925 book, give or take, we would not be able to find that reflection on posterity that I just read to you. We wouldn't find it at all. There is, however, a reassuring ellipsis, three dots, to show that those editors uh, skipped something. By my count, my own count, there are three selections in the Library of Congress's uh, Krevker manuscript containing opening passage, passages, opening passages to individual selections within this wonderful treasure of a manuscript. Uh, there are three selections that do not appear in the 1925 collection sketches at all, and therefore not in the Penguin Classics paperback. Uh, for example, there's no ellipsis, no indication of, of something that they're leaving out in The Frontier Woman, which is another of these selections, nor is there one in the piece that Krevker entitled The American Belisarius. So the 1920s editors did provide an asterisk and a note at the beginning of the piece whose title Krevker takes from that Old Testament book of Isaiah, The Man of Sorrow. So their little note says a portion of the long introduction has been omitted. But then at the end of it, those editors omitted the last page of Krevker's manuscript without providing an ellipsis. Now, as we look at the next slide, Mm, it's back. You'll recognize that there's a passage not quite midway down that involves an almost oversized capital letter Q. Indeed, it'll look like a Q rather than like an Arabic numeral 2, which we associate with cursive writing. And yes, it's the truism that I've been quoting about it's being easier to ask a question than to answer it, as we'll see with this other slide that also appears to include a capital letter Q. Or does it? To read from this manuscript for a moment, it is astonishing what a rapid progress it, and in particular a community of, of settlers, has made even in my days. Let me, let me move ahead a moment. When my father died, which is 12 years ago, it was then but 47 years old, it contained 1,800 freeholders, 
and now by the modern computation it amounts to 2,370. That is above 14,220 souls, black and white, above 288 head of cattle. Now, he has struck through the number 288, and again, the arrow points to the 288, and you see that he struck through it in the manuscript. And he wrote above it 12 what? 12Q? If we take a moment to divide 12 into 288, we get a refreshingly whole number, 24. So if 12Q equals 288, then the value of the Q would be 24, which would mean that the Q is what? This, this squiggle does appear to represent a unit of measure, but I'm afraid I don't know for sure whether it is indeed a Q. Maybe a theta, a Greek character theta. I'm afraid, too, that I have yet to find an abbreviation or a symbol that Kravker might be using here. Let's look now at a snippet from near the end of Susquehanna, coming so near the end that it appears only a handful of manuscript pages before the sheet on which Kravker had doubled back to jot down that fragmentary passage that he named the Undaunted Woman, that horribly messy-looking um, image I showed you a minute ago. So this passage comes shortly before that one, and, it, and he obviously didn't mark this one up nearly as much. Let me read from it a moment. At other places where convenient brooks are, they have erected sawmills with immense labor and with singular ingenuity converted the neighboring pines into the finest boards. I have seen many upwards of three feet wide and 18 feet long, 70, uh-oh, 70 what, 70 Q? If so, if so, 70 Q of inch boards is looked upon there as a good year's work besides attending other avocations. This symbol, which looks like a Q, clearly represents a unit of measure, but I can't tell that it's the same unit of measure as we see here. And, and thank goodness for that arrow. Here the mark looks like the one we saw a few slides back where Krevker had written between the lines and it seemed to say uh, 12Q. And here it seems to say 25Q. The plains, and again, I'm, I'm going to read real quickly. The plains contained between those cliffs are of different dimensions, some 1,000, some, what, 25Q? Acres. Whatever that mark is, and it certainly resembles a Q, its value had seemed to be 24, as in 24 cattle, so here might some 1,000, some 25Q mean some 1,000, some 25 times 24, or 600. It does seem possible, just as it seems possible, that the value of this symbol here is a number other than 24. If so, then the value in the other passages, one enumerating head of cattle, one enumerating inch boards of lumber, might or might not be the same. A moment ago, I mentioned that Three of these symbols, whatever they are, appear within three manuscript pages. So now I want to show you a page which contains two of them. And I don't believe they're going to be arrows, but let's see. Nope. There are two passages here that contain the narrator's reference to 600 what? It looks like 600 Q of land. Here, as in that first passage, the symbols seem to be representing a unit of measure, specifically a number of acres. In another, the symbol seems to be describing another surface area, inch boards, and, and in yet another, it seems to be counting head of cattle. Before I ask the question, that squiggle that looks up here like a Q, what in the world is it? I want to describe for you how the Penguin Classics paperback presents these passages, or at least several of them. The one that referred a moment ago to above 14,220 souls, black and white. So looking back at this one, if you look at the same portion of the Penguin Classics paperback, um, it doesn't appear there because it's from a selection that did not appear in either of the books that Penguin uh, cobbled together to make this paperback, Letters from an American Farmer from 1782, and the posthumous sketches of 18th century America from 1925. So this counting of souls and cattle does appear in the selection, A Happy Family Disunited by the Spirit of Civil War. Again, a title, another title that you're hearing perhaps for the first time, certainly the first time uh, this afternoon. So that selection, A Happy Family Disunited by the Spirit of Civil War, is in the John Harvard Library edition, uh, having appeared in a somewhat different form in this 1995 collection. 
Uh, and before that selection, A Happy Family Disunited by the Spirit of Civil War ever appeared in print, by the way, uh, scholars had known of its existence, and uh, A.W. Plumstead had described it in 1977 as a, quote, simplified typology, or almost like a microcosm, of the pieces that constitute letters. Okay, in the Penguin Classics paperback, this passage from the manuscript, which we saw a moment ago with what seems like 25Q, in, in the book it ends up saying simply some 1,000, some 250 acres, as if that squiggle, Q, is a zero. Okay, now this passage from the manuscript, ends up saying simply, I have seen many upwards of three feet wide and 18 feet long, period. It's certainly simpler this way. But there's no ellipsis, and the text resumes in, in the Penguin Classics version with a new paragraph beginning at this recital, which is pretty squarely in the middle of the screen here. Um, so again, there's no, there's no real indication there of what those editors back in the 1920s were leaving in and, and just skipping. Uh, let's look at the two that appear on the same manuscript page again. And again, without the benefit of arrows. The first one appears simply as, it is said to, con I'm sorry, it is said to contain about 6,000 acres of land. That's looking at the Penguin Classics edition. The second one here simply disappears. So in other words, it doesn't even appear in the Penguin Classics edition, but at least this time there is an ellipsis, which begins immediately after that catalog. And there, again, you you might be able to tell there's a list there of trees, the same sort of trees such as swamp or pin oak, maple, white and black ash, willow, alder, etc., and which ends just before here, imagination may easily foresee the immense agricultural riches which this great country and this spot in particular will contain. I never travel anywhere without feeding in this manner on those contemplative images. Rather than following suit and using an ellipsis here, the new John Harvard Library edition includes the text that I'll now read to you from the slide showing the manuscript. And it, it'll take just a moment. It is therefore susceptible of producing the richest grasses, burden, timpathy, foul meadow, clover, and all the spear grasses which are so natural to this country. But who can tell at what period this great achievement will be accomplished when so noble a monument of the industry of man will be completed? Infinitely remarkable will it be indeed because the sum of labor and industry will be viewed in a more collective manner. It is, I believe, very difficult to determine the exact extent of its superficies, but admitting the general computation to be pretty near right, here is then 600, and again, 600 what? 600 Q? Acres of the most valuable and most useful soil which posterity has to clear and the benefits of which it has to enjoy. What an amazing population will necessarily arise on the circumjacent lands. Almost at the bottom of the screen here. There are a great number of islands and other, and he, uh, he repeated circumjacent lands and then caught himself and struck through it. So there are a great number of islands and other high grounds interspersed throughout the whole. Seldom or ever do you see here any considerable level without some gentle slopes, and I think he spelled it slops, um, without some happy intermissions which seem destined for the future habitation of mankind as a place of retreat and as a site for their future dwellings. In reading from this slide, I've inserted an and where there wasn't one. That and does appear in the John Harvard Library edition as one of a finite number of editorial emendations. How, though, do I treat those squiggles that I've been showing you that seem to look or not look like cues? To return to that passage I've shown you in the manuscript of Rock of Lisbon, it is easier to ask a question than to answer it. So here's the question for you. What do we make of those squiggles? Could it be the Greek character theta? While I don't know definitively what the squiggle is supposed to be, he is using it to represent what seem to be several different units of measure influences the way that I see that mark when I look at the manuscript, and therefore I've presented it as a theta, the Greek character theta, in four of the five passages that are in the John Harvard Library edition. It's easier to ask a question than to answer it. And yes, for me, this approach to one of the simple yet crucial questions that came with this project seems to be much more in keeping, really, with the way that this 18th century writer, this very ambitious 18th century writer born in France and then transformed himself into an American, the ways he approached the world around him. He certainly did so in a more inquisitive and expansive way than did his most familiar narrator, 
The Farmer James, whose voice we hear whenever we read letter three, what is an American? Farmer James is, after all, quite the bumpkin. Rather than being someone who would have ever heard of, for example, this dour looking fellow. I've, I've borrowed this image, the likeness of Niccolo Machiavelli, from the website that entices us to leave here right now and head over to the Embassy of Italy for their exhibition that will be up through the middle of next week, apparently. If you've been uh, to the exhibition or even to the Embassy's website, you'll recognize the title, and I'm quoting Niccolo Machiavelli, The Prince and Its Era, 1513 to 2013. Ouch. Here in D.C., it's especially easy to believe that we are indeed still in The Prince and Its Era. Well, here in this selection within Crevker's manuscript entitled The Frontier Woman, oh, the arrow. This narrator, whoever the narrator is, is dropping the name Machiavelli, as you see at the bottom of this slide. So is this narrative voice interchangeable with that of Farmer James? I suggest, and I do so heartily, that we're not hearing Farmer James here. Rather, I find that Crevaker, this ambitious writer, this American farmer, who certainly fancies himself a man of letters, is showing us readers what he can do, showing us a small portion of the range of voices and perspectives that he has built into that treasure that the Library of Congress purchased in 1986. If I were to say that he folds them into it, I would be playing with a metaphor that might suggest bread making. If I said that he weaves the voices together or makes a quilt of these various narratives, I would be trying to use a metaphor that seems more apt than the cliche he gave us, the notion of America as a melting pot. Thinking about bread making reminds me it's time for lunch. Oh, so here's a view of the last page in the copy that the Library of Congress made for me of the microfilm of this wonderful manuscript. And on that note, I thank you each and all. Thank you so much. Uh, John Cole, wonderful host, promised that we'd have time for questions and answers. Uh, I think we do, and, and I, I think the questions will be brief, and I'm sure the answers will be brief. Um, do, we, do we have questions? Yes, Julie Miller from the Manuscript Division. Yes. So my question for you is, have you discovered that there are any other manuscripts in your Yes. Let me, let me, because it's such a crucial question in working with these materials. And it's the question that takes us outside the finite stash of material that's down in the vault. So in other words, a number of the passages I showed you seem very clearly to be something that the writer, that Kravker, copied over as if he had been drafting and then found the time to sit down and, and make a clean copy. Some don't, and the one that I showed you twice that had all those marks on it seemed to be maybe an earlier version, a draft of something, and I, I hope that in showing you the, the transcription of it from the book, uh, I, I hope I emphasize that he did double back and use that material on that particular sheet, actually in another selection. Okay? Now, part of the question is, do we know where some of those I suppose earlier versions or drafts are. Um, it is easier to ask a question. Right? I don't, and I've looked, and I've, I've spent some time and energy looking. One place to look is uh, up at the Beinecke Library, up at Yale. They've, they've uh, much more recently than the acquisition here, they've purchased some manuscripts. And some, some of the materials there uh, include literally some letters that Krevker, as the writer, wrote to his family, wrote to other people. But I haven't, and in, in spending, getting to spend some time there, I haven't found anything there that would amount to, say, an earlier version of these materials. And I looked, and I want to go back and look some more. Um, so in other words, another way to, to think about the question and to think about how difficult it is to come up with a definitive answer other than, I don't know yet. Another way to think about it would, would be to picture that material that John Cole told us he had, that Crevacor had in his trunk. And of course, by trunk, we're not talking about trunk in the way that we would use that expression nowadays, thinking about automobiles and 
that, but literally a, a, a container, a piece of luggage in which he had indeed put these materials at the bottom under some clothes and under some other stuff, perhaps trusting that nobody would bother to look for it there, but they did, and they found it. So again, one way to think about the question is, before he concealed these materials that the Library of Congress now purchases, did he copy earlier versions? I suspect very much that he did. Did he throw away those earlier versions? I fear that he did. Uh, and I guess in terms of requests, I would suggest that if and when any of you if and when any of you find some of those earlier materials, and again, maybe individual sheets, maybe something that someone else has found and picked up and written a letter on. In other words, in some collection, some archive, maybe in some garage sale, when you find them, send me a postcard. <laughs> and, oh, John, there's laughter across the room. But I'm, again, in this, in this ongoing quest to find out what this man was doing and how he wrote and how complex his process of writing was, it's a crucial question. And I wish that, I mean, maybe we can get back together when more of that material surfaces. Thanks so much for asking that, that question. Are there, are there other, other questions? Yes, Paul Erickson over here. Um, just thinking about the, the history of the, of the book as a book, were there yes. 19th century editions between its initial burst of popularity in the 18th century in 1925? Or? There were one or two right at the beginning of the, of the 1800s, mm -hmm. okay? And again, which would be just after that, that huge upheaval in France that involved not only the revolution, but Napoleon, in other words, this, this disruption to his own life and the life of his family and, and the people that he identified with. Um, so in other words, I, I, there were one, possibly two, but one edition in the early 19th century a fellow uh, named Charles Lamb, who we associate with, with early romantic writing in England, uh, describes and writes about and, and seems really drawn to some of the materials that Crevecker had written, but I, I'm not aware of any reference of his to the, it, the edition that's just come out, in other words, to any particularly recent versions of it. I, I believe Lamb is reading old copies. Now, in 1904, which is a century after, Paul, the period you're talking about, in 1904 there was an edition that in some very specific ways reintroduced Krevker and his question, what is an American, to generations that really weren't familiar, to, uh, weren't familiar with Krevker or with this book that had been such a hit back in the 1780s. So 1904, yeah, there's an edition, and, and, and there are copies of it in a number of libraries around, including the, the library at Florida State University. Okay. Now, shortly after, as, as timing goes, shortly after 1904, D.H. Lawrence is describing, is, has chosen Krevker as one of the figures to celebrate in that book of his, um, Studies in Classic American Literature. And do I think Lawrence goes overboard? Well, yeah. But again, in helping reintroduce some readers to a, a name and a, an approach and a set of descriptions that really had become so unfamiliar by then. Uh, another really good question. Other questions? Yes, Julie Miller. Um, the manuscript has other handwriting. Yes, it has three. One, okay, there, and again, I guess in holding up the, the three fingers here, I'm, I'm saying that in, in putting together this scholarly edition, um, this approved edition by the Committee on Scholarly Editions for the mid-1990s, um, I did a lot of digging and found and figured out that there are three different handwritings. The one that is uh, hardest, uh, that for me is just impossible to identify, other than saying it's some scribal hand that's, that's that he engaged someone to use. Let me see real quickly if I can get back to, yeah. This particular image, and again, this is the first page of, of a selection he called The Frontier Woman. You see at the top, underneath the title, he's come back in a different hand, right? Different scribble and written, translated. Now, 
I insisted early in my own comments today that he didn't really translate these materials into French. He rewrote them. He reworked them. If anything, he knew and, the, and, and his contemporaries knew how the American Revolution was really going to end or had ended. So translated, I take as rewritten, redone. No need to go back to this one to, to try to turn it into something to sell more books. But the handwriting up there that says translated is, has much more in common with the bulk of these other selections I've shown you. In other words, it looks more like what he seemed to be writing. This other hand is especially hard to read, and not simply because it's such a small image here. Um, there's some idiosyncrasies in, in this handwriting that make, for example, their, their E's, lowercase E's, that look exactly like O's. So in other words, someone wrote in a, in a different way from the way that he does. And that's, that's two of the three hands. Um, I, I have not, I've not been able to come up with myself, nor have been able to find any identification of who the, um, who the clerical assistant or who the relative might have been. But it's, it's, it's the kind of fascinating question that we come up with when we really start looking at these materials. And Julie, going back to, to I think, the, the description that you provided, John Paul, one of the benefits of even having the manuscript division here and having these, uh, these treasures here is that scholars are able to come and, and not only figure out that such a question exists, but to work really hard to come up with perhaps a, a, a more definitive answer than I've been able to, to give you. Send me a postcard. Okay. Yes, Tim Sweet, please. Tim, that's a, it's a wonderful question. How does the editorial work I've done shape or, or maybe help us even rethink our understanding of those 12 pieces that became Letters from an American Farmer? Um, I, I'm not sure. First of all, Tim, and again, this is Professor Tim Sweet, I'm really not sure that he walked in having picked those 12 selections. I really wish I knew that. And my wish list also includes figuring out where the records for that company, if they survive at all, where they've gotten to. So that, again, just hoping and wishing that there would be some, some notation, some record of who it was that worked with them. Again, in, in effect, as the editor of them, who it was that either decided or consulted with the author to say, let's put this one over here. You know, for God's sake, let's build up to the one, and the one I tried so hard not to give too much away about it, but the one whose title, at the end, after all, is Distresses of a Frontier Man. Okay, so again, that book, you can tell, that book's not going to end well. It's not going to end nearly as uh, cheerfully as Letter 3 makes us think. So again, that progression is something that fascinates me as much as it did the first time I read those selections in numerical order. We still, we still don't know. We still don't know the extent to which Krevkar as writer exercised any agency on selecting. We don't know whether the printer said, step back, this is what we do, we will, put, we will come up with quite a book. I believe that together they did. And that's not to avoid your question, it's, it's another in a series of answers here that where I have to admit we don't know yet. Oh. A few minutes ago I mentioned before I looked at my watch that talking about some of these metaphors about how he stirred all this material together have to remind us that it really is time to eat. And I think before we get to eat, I think John Cole is going to remind us that there's a table out there with two dozen copies of this new book on it, and I'm perfectly willing to sign one if you'd like. Let's start by giving Dennis a wonderful hand for a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.